Hello again. The Practical Animal Channel is dedicated to the public understanding of conservation by showcasing what conservationists do. These are their stories. Today's guest is an expert on Harris Hawks. Jobs with Hawks include being a field biologist, a falcon breeder, a pest controller, a display falconer, a professional falconer, an author and publisher, and a specialist avian vet. Anita Ebden is founder and director of Hampshire Hawk Walks in England, a business that could be described as a niche display enterprise. Anita's business shows just what is possible if you want to make birds of prey your life and work. Watch until the end for Bird of Prey research project ideas. Anita, what can you tell me about this fantastic chick behind you? Um, so this was a bit of an impulse buy, actually. So I was asked recently to do quite a lot more work with schools and things with um, children. Harris hawks are awesome. My favourite bird of prey. And I swore I'd never have anything other than a Harris hawk. But um, it was a it was an idea that came into my head. Maybe I need a native species. And a friend of mine said, get a barn owl. You can't go wrong with barn owl. So I spoke to a friend of mine that breeds all sorts of things. And I went, Jason, have you got an owl? And he went, I haven't, but I've got a friend that's got a two-week-old one. Do you want one to imprint? And I was like, I'll think about it. Well, two days later, Willow <laughs> arrived. So here I am with Willow and learning all about imprinting and feeding baby barn owls and loving every minute of it, I have to say. So, um, yeah, it's a journey and very, very different to the Harris Hawk life and world. So, but lots to learn and really, really enjoyable. So, um, and yeah, just be something different to do. So I think I always just set out to do nothing but hawk walks. And I've realised that they're a little bit limiting. Um, and I like educating and I like working with children. So I have a Kestrel who's great for that. Now with a little bar and owl, I think that will be. And I'm hoping that I can do some kind of, not hawk walk, but flying experience with the bar and owl as well. That's the plan. People all have barn owls, don't they? So every time I speak to people, like, oh my gosh, you've got a barn owl. So I, I, I'm hoping it will open up a few other opportunities in terms of falconry experiences for me. Mm. Does that help? <laughs> Is that <laughs> a good question? It's all been a bit whirlwind, to be honest, but I have a lot to learn. Hmm. A whirlwind in what way, Anita? How are they different from Harris's Hawks? Um, I think just the whole being a bit stupid um, I mean obviously it's really early days and, and he's learned who I am and things like that but Harris Hawks I just see they are an out and out hunting machine everything is just about going out hunting killing and that's kind of it you can't I, I have amazing relationships with all my Harris Hawks and I adore them but I don't 100% trust them with any of my customers don't be wrong, they're all great birds, but there's always that. Are they going to do that thing that you don't want them to do? Um, they're quite big and empowering and they're just different. Yeah, owls are, are a different school of thought. And I never thought I'd cross, as a lot of my friends have said, over to the dark side. Um, but I think I'll learn a lot. And it's just it's just another thing to learn about, I guess. Well, ask, me, cool. me, ask me again in a year time when <laughs> I've got the measure of it all and I've tried to learn to fly it and and got frustrated because it doesn't do things as quickly as a Harris Hawk does and then I might have a different opinion. They don't have a crop do they Anita? So how does sort of weight control and food control work when an, be with an owl that doesn't have a crop? Uh, that's why they're hard to train I guess um, from what I understand so I've even found initially with Willow um, I was panicking because there's a lot of do you, don't you with casting material when they're young. 
and the guy I bought it from said that it was on casting material so I fed it casting material and then I was worried because after a couple of days it hadn't cast a pellet and it looked swollen and I was worried it had a blockage and after talking to lots of people and reading lots of books and basically just having just gut feeling that there was something not quite right I was like that bird's got a blockage so I didn't I didn't feed it for a good 12 to 18 hours and then all of a sudden little willow cast three massive great pellets thankfully so it proves there was too much in there um and that all came out so yeah again weight control and learning all of that thing without a crop is going to be something that will be different to my other birds of prey but I fly a kestrel um, and their weight management is quite challenging so I think being an imprint the the owl will be easier to train and I've never imprinted anything before and I've never owned an imprint so it's a, a completely different um thing to learn to do again as well which is another reason why I wanted a barn owl because they're relatively good and straightforward to imprint I wanted to imprint a Harris Hawk and my first mentor told me that I wasn't allowed to and you don't need to so I haven't but I would have liked to but it comes with risks as I understand again so how old is Willow just coming up to three weeks old it's hard to imagine that probably by the end of September Willow will be flying which to me is mind-blowing but uh that's what I'm told their progress is, is very swift so it will be bouncing around in the house before that, annoying my husband, driving him completely nuts, making a mess everywhere. And uh, I will probably be tearing my hair out, but uh, I will enjoy it anyway as well. So, but, uh, Is husband not a falconer? My husband is definitely not a falconer, no. My husband um, is not an animal person, which is how I ended up with birds of prey, weirdly. So... Um, yeah, he he's a very, very accommodating. He's very supportive, but he does nothing in terms of handling, feeding, looking after, really. Um, it's all down to me. So, uh, But he does pay for a lot of it, so I can't moan about that. I basically spend all my time looking after birds. Um, and he said to me, I've never seen anybody so happy. So if you're happy, that's good enough for me. So no, I, I do understand. I think you have to be quite selfish um, and a little bit of a weirdo to be an obsessive falconer. falconer. It's not for many people. So it's, it is all encompassing. I say to everybody, it's a life, it's not a hobby. And it definitely is. I don't, I think my husband says to me, he said, every other word that comes out of your mouth is hawk. It drives me nuts, but it makes you happy. And uh, those birds give you a reason to get up every day. And that's what we all need in our lives. So yeah, yeah. that's what we do. Brilliant. I love that. <laughs> um, how did you get into it, Falconry? Oh, Crumbs, do you want the true long story? I want the true long story. The true long story. So um, I used to work as a professional gardener. So I was out on my own all day. I worked for wealthy customers that had big estates and I would be out on my own doing gardening all day long. And one day I said to my husband, I love my job, but I am lonely and I would really like to get a dog. Um, my husband, not being a dog person, was like, I don't want a dog. They stink, they make a mess. Um, it'll be running around, this, that, and the other. And uh, he bought me a falconry experience down in the New Forest with a lovely chap called Keith at New Forest Falconry. And on that experience day, I got to handle an eagle, lots of owls, lots of different falcons. And then he got out this little Harris Hawk and his name was Pee Wee. Um, and I was absolutely smitten by this little bird. Um, it was an imprint, um, quite a badly behaved imprint, actually, looking back on it now. Um, all the birds were quite badly behaved that day because somebody had overfed them the day before. But I was a naive punter that knew nothing about falconry. Um, and I went home, did some homework about Harris Hawks and learned a bit about them. and was talking to a guy in my local butcher and he I said to him, I went on this falconry day and I met Harris Hawk and it was so cool. And he said, oh, one of my customers has got Harris Hawks. I'll have a chat to him and he might well let you come around and meet his. So uh, 24 hours later, I got a call from a guy going, oh, hey, you want to come and see my Harris Hawks? So I did. I went and saw him. And it was during the first avian flu outbreak, which must have been about seven odd years ago, seven or eight years ago, something like that. 
I got to handle his birds and I helped him coat beaks and stuff like that. And we got chatting and, and I said, I wanted a dog and my husband said no. And he said, well, why don't you buy a Harris Hawk and take it to work with you and keep that can keep you company. He said, the biggest thing is having land. And if your customers have all got hundreds of acres, you've got somewhere to fly it. So that got my little brain thinking. And I was like, well, I don't know anything about keeping them. And he said, you're a natural, you'll be fine. I'll teach you. So next thing I know, I'm researching buying a Harris Hawk. Um, and then I ordered one and then my husband got diagnosed with his leukemia. So um, the time came that the chick that I'd ordered was ready to be picked up at 18 weeks old. And I said to them a few weeks before, I said, I can't have it. My husband's ill in hospital. I, I can't raise a Harris Hawk at the moment. So we put it on hold and a year later I got my first Hawk Neo. Um, by that time, um, Don, who was gonna help me, he had moved to Kansas and taken his hawks and everything to America. So I was like, who the hell is gonna help me learn to do falconry? And he said, oh, I'll teach you on, online. Well, we keep in touch, but that was never gonna work. So I contacted various groups and people um, and I found myself a local mentor um, and he helped me through my first season. So, but Neo, I took everywhere with me like a dog. He went in my van to work with me every day. Um, I flew him before work and then he sat on a perch and I carried him around the garden and he was, for all intents and purposes, a pet. Um, but then he caught his first rabbit and I got into hunting and then I met a guy that did hawk walks um, and now I've got nine birds of prey in my own thriving hawk walk business. So that's how it all started. All quite random, but lots of opportunities arose and back in the old days I would have just gone, do you know what, I don't know enough um, and not, not gone out on a limb, but I took a few things that could have gone wrong but they didn't because I worked hard um and I'm good at talking to people and I'm a good salesperson and I've got, got good land um and the most important thing is I don't mind doing 18 hour days every day because that's what you get to where you get to you do you know what I mean and, and you've got to learn on your feet all the time and you've got to make mistakes and pick yourself back up and do it again and that's what's happened so uh I'm definitely not the finished article and I've still got so much to learn, but every day is a school day. And I love that about falconry. Definitely do. So. Oh, that was brilliant. I love so that. that. My story, which is all a little bit random, but that's how I got to where I am. So certainly not, not a, like a path of, I want to be a falconer. It all just kind of, you know, one thing led to another and here I am now, the happiest person on the planet. So. Fantastic. I love that. <laughs> Anita. What's your best Harris Hawk fact? Um, my favourite fact about Harris Hawks is that they do a behaviour called stacking. And it is the fact that in the wild, Harris Hawks live in an environment where there are limited perching spaces. Um, it's very hot. So they sit on one another's backs like a totem pole. Um, I think they believe, number one, it's to help shade one another in very hot conditions but also to um, obviously give them a better and higher lookout point once they're hunting. It's unique to Harris Hawks, which I love. What's your most treasured possession in your hawking bag? Uh, this is going to sound a little bit morbid, but I think it's my dispatch spike, because when you are flying, especially Harris Hawks, you never know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Um, and... My main thing about hunting is that whatever you catch, it has a quick and swift dispatch. Um, and dispatch is not easy when a hawk is holding on to something and doesn't want to let it go. So um, I have a dispatch spike that was given to me by a good friend that's got a lovely handmade handle um, and it does the job swiftly and I love it. Yeah, so that's a bit of a morbid thing, but I wouldn't be without it if I've got to go... Obviously, you've got to have your food and everything else, but I ne I always make sure I have an implement um, to, to do a swift dispatch on something. Um, and you can use it on most things. So that works for me. So I think I think that makes me sound like a proper falconer, though. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> now, my, my favourite question, which I actually only came up with this week. Where's the strangest place you've ever found a forgotten day old chick? Oh my God, do you want the really, really true story on this one? So this one, this is, this is horrific. <laughs> okay, so as a falconer um, and somebody that hunts and hunts rabbits, I also own a number of ferrets, nine in total now. Um, 
day old chicks get everywhere. I don't know how, but they do. Um, and when you have ferrets, they get even more places. So I came home okay. from being out with my hawks one day to my husband. He, my husband calls me Noodle. Um, and I get a screaming, Noodle, come in here. You need to sort this out. So I walk in the kitchen and it's during the middle of the summer. And there is this god awful smell. And uh, he's he's decided to use, he needed a towel or something, but it's something he, he decided to put the tumble dryer on, not sure why. But oh my word, there was this disgusting stench coming from the tumble dryer. And I was like, yeah, I have an idea that I know what's gone on there. So I said to him, don't worry, leave me to it, I'll sort this out. So I have to pull out the washing machine to get the tumble dryer out. So I've got the tumble dryer out. And behind the tumble dryer, I find that my ferrets have been, I knew that they'd been going in there. They don't usually get in the house, but a couple of times they'd come in the house and they'd been playing in the laundry and I hadn't thought anything of it. And they'd gone down the back of the tumble dryer, pulled the hose off that goes into the tumble dryer. And they had managed to put a day old chick inside the tumble dryer. Now this day old chick had been there, I reckon a good week, perhaps 10 days in the summer. I stuck my hand in there and to say there were a lot of maggots would have been an understatement. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever known. But uh, anyway, it would have been good fishing bait. He's a good fisherman, but he wasn't having any of it. So um, yeah, that is, but where the chick came from in the first place must have been out of a hawking bag or something that I'd left that the ferrets could get to because I don't leave chicks lying around generally. But yeah, so that was kind of related to the hawks, but yeah. That's that's the worst place I've ever found um, a day old chick. My husband says that I use it like a badge of honor when I put my hand in my pocket and bring out half a dead animal of some description. That's just, uh, you get used to it, don't you, when you're a falconer? That's just the way it is. Brilliant. Anita, please can you describe your business? Because it strikes me that it's quite unique in that a lot there's a lot of birds of prey centers out there offering hawk walks but you specialise in hawk walks with her socks. Tell me about that. Yeah, so um, I learned from a, my original, my original mentor was an amazing guy called Jason, um, and he ran a, a company called New World Falconry over in Fernhurst, Mid Midhurst Way. I rang him, him up one day and said, I've got my own bird, I've had it for a year, it's been a bit of a naughty boy, I need somebody to, to kind of give me some pointers. And he said, I don't help people. There's too many wannabe falconers out there, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, fair point, I get it. Um, I said, look, um, I'm not a person to take no for an answer. So can I come and book a hawk walk with you? Um, not really knowing what a hawk walk was, even owning, owning my own Harris hawk. So I pitched up over at this, guy, at this guy's place and um, we went out for a walk for an hour and a half around some lovely woodland. And I flew um, this most amazing Harris hawk called London, who I have to admit at the time, I thought was a little bit of a tatty old hawk. And I thought my gorgeous one-year-old Neo was far superior to any hawk that had, had ever flown the planet. But um, anyway, um, at the end of this hour and a half, um, which he pulled me apart to be fair on all the things that I was doing wrong, um, he said, you are actually quite a talented falconer and I'm gonna help you. And we became really good friends. So I learned all about doing hawk walks from this guy who did them as he did out in this lovely wild woodland, um, talking all about Harris hawks and Harris hawk psychology and why they are what they are. So that's how I learned. And to cut a long story short, Jason, after about eight months, turned around to me and said, I'm moving to Australia. And London, the little hawk that uh, I flew that day was for sale. And I said to him, can I buy London from you? And he said, yeah, I'll be happy to sell him to you. And I said to him, I know I've not doing, been doing this for very long, but do you think in time I could ever do hawk walks? And that's how I ended up doing hawk walks. But to get to where what you're asking, I only ever knew doing hawk walks the way Jason did them. I don't, I'm not saying I disagree with centres at all. I don't. I just didn't want to keep birds of prey sat there to be looked at. I like, especially Harris's hawks, they are a, a species that are intelligent. They like to be hunting. They like to be active. I always liken them to spaniels. They're kind of like, what are we doing? Where are we going? You know, all, all the time you're going out, they want to be active. They want to be doing things. Um, so, and then I'd, I'd, I'd learned to hunt and I like the hunting aspect. So 
The key thing with doing hall walks is venue. Um, centres a lot of the time are placed somewhere where they might have a field, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't have a lot of space to do a hawk walk. Um, I'm really lucky I have Chawton House, which is a beautiful 500 acre estate, um, a five minute drive away. And they were, I was doing rabbit control for them there and flying my own bird there. So they were happy when I said, if I pay you some money, would you like me to do hawk walks here? And it fitted really well in with their, um, what they wanted to do. So that's how I, I got the access there. And then since then, I've now acquired an even closer uh, 1,000, well, one and a half thousand acre estate with some beautiful woodland. So um, I I think the first experience I did was great, but it, I was in a group of people. And I think in a group situation, what you want to get out of it is always diluted. So Jason always did his experiences. Your booking is your booking. So you don't, you don't get chucked in with somebody you don't know. So I've always maintained that as my experience so people want a one-to-one -one experience whether it's just them or whether it's their family I will take up to five possibly six people at a time but I like it to be intimate and small and for the hawk not to feel stressed at any time um, and it's for it to be very natural so that's how I've just developed it really I, I don't think what I do is particularly unique I just think it's probably less financially viable for a lot of places because um, I can't do that many and I can't make that much money out of it, but I'm lucky because I don't need to, because financially I, the business is just a lifestyle business. So what I make is what keeps the birds, which means I can go out and fly birds all day long. I've also wanted to, um, develop a hunting experience. So this year is the first year that I have become a gamekeeper and released my own pheasants into the woodland to hunt myself and with customers. Uh, avian flu allowing obviously and I'm really lucky I've got a woodland it had a release pen in it landowner said yeah crack on do what you like I don't ever have holidays I don't like holidays so what I would have spent on a holiday I've spent on 400 pheasants um, and that's been another learning curve and I've got reeves as well that was stupid because they just want to attack you and kill you but that's another story so yeah so again it's just I bought them as a present to my hawks because they like to kill pheasants and so do I so yeah that's what I've done. I mean, we've got rabbits, we've got hares, we've got all sorts of stuff up there. So with my customers, I offer a bird that will go and hunt something, or you can have a bird that's less likely to hunt something. So that's, I don't know, I just do what I feel is right. That's what I, my, that's my whole ethos with my business is so long as the birds are really well cared for and as long as they're happy and my customers are happy, that's all that matters to me. Gamekeeping sounds like not a departure, but quite an undertaking. Had you had experience of that or how did you learn that? What, gamekeeping? Hmm. Lots of friends that are gamekeepers. Um, a really, really, really helpful neighbouring farmer that used to have a shoot on the farm next door. I used to always keep chickens and I've always loved birds. Um, and it started off with me just wanting to put a few guinea fowl into the woodland, but the landowner said no because they're too noisy. Um, and then a friend of mine who has got a big estate and a shoot, um, I was talking to him and we were just talking about birds and he put me in touch with his gamekeeper um, who had just start, had sort of bred all of his own um, poults from um, laying birds. So all his laying birds were surplus to requirements at a cheap price. So I was like, oh, I'll buy those then. Um, and I've just asked loads of people for help. Um, I got a bit of a working party. I spent weeks up there in the summer getting the pen ready. I, I, you just have to learn it that's falconry isn't it you you know and it's the most heartbreaking thing going up there and seeing dead dead pheasants some of them are getting caught by goshawks we've got goshawks we've got buzzards I've got everything up there that wants to eat them but that's that's again it's just a learning process and you can't stop that so um yeah I mean my biggest worry is avian flu obviously um but again I, I just don't think we can live with this I'm never going to do anything in case that happens but I'll have to manage that risk as and when if it becomes a problem. So there we are. Um, but yeah, my especially Trinity, my main hunting hawk, she she will fly at pheasants all day long and she is amazing. And I just want her to have some fun this year. So and so do I. <laughs> yeah. Now that does remind me actually, I was just reading an article in a in a well-known scientific journal, and um, it was talking about. Uh, a major bird protection charity in the UK wanting to ban 
uh, all releases of game birds for sporting purposes. What do you think about that? I do understand their thinking, and I'm a bit on the fence on this. I know that sounds like I'm bucking out of an answer. Do I agree with the huge great shoots releasing 40,000 birds and stuff? No, I don't. Um, I don't think that's good ecologically. Um, and I think that's what causes a lot of the tension between hunting and all of those sorts of things. What I've done in the woods, it feeds the buzzards, it feeds a lot of the wildlife in there. Um, you know, you're not having a an impact on insect life, other bird life, forcing other things out because it's all been massacred by millions of pheasants. And what I'm doing is natural in terms of the fact that most of them will disappear off into the wild um, and my birds will catch one or two of them. I'm probably one of the only people in the country that's released birds specifically to do hunting with hawks. I mean, I see that all birds of prey need to do what they want to do naturally, and I'm just assisting them a little bit and helping them to do that and make it easier. Um, what's the goal of your business, Anita? Number one, to wake up every morning with a smile on my face and make enough money, as I am doing, to fly and keep my birds to a high standard. Um, but most importantly is to educate people um, and take them out um, and enjoy an experience with a bird of prey and just try and spread awareness about birds of prey generally and give people an opportunity to see them close up. My thing has always been, and I think probably the, the secret to my success is people like the natural aspect. Um, and since I've had my private woodland, that has been a massively popular uh, venue to do it because the birds are just flying completely free doing what Harris Hawks do um, and obviously if you know Harris Hawks they're just they're like a flying dog um, and so for most people it's amazing that you can stand in the middle of woodland I can whistle and this bird appears from nowhere and lands on their glove um, trying to teach my red tail to do that but that's going to be work in progress over quite some time um, but yeah so I think for me the whole purpose of the business it's for me to have a lifestyle for the next 10, 20 years, hopefully, um, and to be able to maintain a level of taking people out on hawk experiences. Legislation and everything else allows. So, but yeah, at the moment, to just, to be honest, wake up every day and just muddle along as I am doing what I'm doing is is the goal of my business. So, um, yeah, Willow, yeah, Willow, Willow agrees with that. So, uh, yeah. Willow agrees. I'm yeah, glad Willow agrees. agrees. Yeah. She's looking yeah. very alert there. Yeah. <laughs> He's having a good preen. Although he's got no feathers. I say he, it, has got no feathers yet. It's still learn, learning to preen very well. So, I, I've got to admit, my experience has been mostly with birds of prey centres, where they offer hawk walks, but with a variety of birds. Are there many places doing what you do, specialising up to now in Harris's hawks? The only other person, well, no, so there, there is one other place, uh, I think Moores Valley, um, that somebody has been on um, that do just do. I mean, I say to people, Harris Hawk, so walks, you can't do it well with anything other than a Harris Hawk because the Harris Hawk has that inbuilt want to follow you around like a dog um, because of their pack instinct. So you can loosely do it with other birds, but generally it's more of a stand in a field and get a bird to fly across to you. Um, I want people to be a bit more immersed in falconry. So falconry being the art of hunting with a bird of prey. When my birds are out, they all have not just the stimulus of the person that they're calling, but the fact that a hare's run across there, the fact that a pheasant's disappeared across there, um, the fact that, uh, you know, um, a bird's just blown that way and whilst they're not going to catch it, they might chase it or see it. So they're immersed in in their world and they bring you into it and people can can get away from other people and when we're out in my woodland we always see deer we've got hares and, and other things as well so um and then we've got wild birds we've got um we generally always see a kestrel because the kestrel attacks the harris hawks as we walk through where their territory is we've got buzzards we've got kites so it's it is more, I tried to sell it as, yes, it's a falconry experience, but it's also a wildlife walk. And I can see, I show people, that's where a, um, a badger's been digging and you can tell that's a badger because, and this is where a hare's been in form or a hare's been digging and just other things like that, that try and um, engage people and children with nature and what's around them, rather than just standing in a field, calling a bird to them and telling you about different types of birds, which you can do at centres. I haven't got the space the housing, the knowledge, or anything else to have 
a range of birds. Although now obviously I've got the, the owl, but my my thing and my passion is Harris Hawks and to know everything there is about Harris Hawks. And ultimately my aim as well is to be somebody that people go, talk to Anita if you've got a problem with the Harris Hawk because she knows Harris Hawks and learn. Just, I sit and spend hours and hours just watching them because they're fascinating and behavior is is so important because of the pack mentality and understanding what just a dip of a head means or just just all sorts of things every, every little movement with a harris hawk means something um and it's very easy to overlook that but when you're out hunting with them we talk to each other and we know each other's every move and that's really part of my passion for them really anita how would you describe the hawk walk industry today I, I think I think there are a few of us doing it in in various ways. I I have a good friend um, up in Shropshire who does really good experiences similar to what I do better because he has a he's got a Benelli's Eagle, um, and he will take you out on a completely immersive experience. I don't know. I don't understand why more people don't do it, but I think a lot of people do do it, but either don't advertise it as well or they do it as a sideline. I have to be honest in business. If you spend too much time worrying about your competitors, you never start a business. So in the nicest possible way, and this is not meaning to be rude to my competitors, but I don't worry about what anybody else does. I worry about what I do. And my aim is just to do what I do really, really well um, and make sure that my standards are what I want. And because if you look at what other people do, you try to copy them and then that's not you. And the most important thing is to be you in life. Funny enough, I've just sold my thousandth walk walk. I've got somewhere in the region of 200 um reviews which are all five stars and very glowing and whenever I have a day when I doubt my ability or I doubt myself I go onto TripAdvisor and I read what people have written and I go do you know what you can do this when you have a day when the bird is annoying or you know you, you, just things don't go to plan um we all have to remind yourself that we will have a bad day at the office and sometimes the birds don't want to play which is fine it's not that I'm a bad falconer um it's just like having a member of staff that's having an off day which is fine you know you just figure it out as you go along so i've learned that to just focus on the positives and, and keep going no matter what and you'll get there that's wonderful do you see your hawks as working birds or members of the family um they are all my business partners i am grateful to them every day for doing what i ask them to do of them and they do it willingly and with enthusiasm um and without them i wouldn't have the amazing life that i've got a smile on my face and the business that i've got so they are definitely working birds. They are my little business partners and I go around every aviary every evening and say goodnight and say thank you for all their hard work every day. Um, and most importantly, London, because he is my favourite. I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> but he's my favourite. And without him, none of this would have happened. So yeah, my gratitude to him every day is, he was like winning the lottery for me. If I hadn't got him, I wouldn't have the life that I have. So He's 24 now, and I just wish he would live forever. But anyway, um, every day that I have him is a bonus. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Hey, Anita, what can you tell me about this bird? Oh, my word. This is Grumpy Guinness. You're Grumpy, aren't you, Guinness? Yeah, so Grumpy Guinness has been with me um, just under two years. Um, I bought him from a, a retiring falconer up in Lincolnshire. Um, and I have to be honest, when I got Guinness, um, he couldn't fly. He was, he was a six-year-old bird, so he's about eight now. And um, yeah, he was crap at flying. I think all he'd ever done was fly backwards and forwards in a field to a post. He came to me with the name Harry the Harris Hawk. And uh, yeah, we were driving back down the M1 um, and I bought another hawk at the same time from this chap who's my lovely, lovely old boy, Caffrey. Um, so we had this hawk, Caffrey, and we were like, well, what are we going to call Harry? Because I'm not having a horror school called Harry. Um, and so Caffrey and Guinness both being Irish beers so that's why we came up with the name Guinness and it suits him the way that I got him flying better was to actually take him out with another Harris hawk that he wanted to chase um, and so he spent his entire time chasing a hawk that he couldn't catch but it really improved his flying skills now he can fly quite well I can't cast fly him because he can catch the hawk and attack it so I can't do that anymore but it works well for fitness training for him uh, what sort of skills or qualities makes somebody a natural for falconry you know you can't tell somebody how to read a bird i have a couple that will be slightly aggressive at, at the bars and some people just don't pick up on that behavior at all and i was like don't put your face near there because a foot will come through and it'll grab your face 
Um, I trained people and they expect you to, to tell them, do this, do that, do this, do that. It's not that simple. The bird tells you what it is you need to do. If a bird, I can go into any of my aviaries without weighing a bird and tell you whether it's at flying weight or not, just, you know, based on behavior. But it's it's about reading the bird, their behavior. I think more so with Harris's maybe than any others because of the pack thing. Yeah, it's it's about building a bond and trust and relationship. And everybody that comes on my walks always says to me, Anita, you can see the relationship and trust you have with that bird. That takes time and effort. And I think that's what a lot of people don't have or don't want to put into falconry. And that's where they fall short. And that's why so many birds get lost because they just think, well, it's a flying weight, I'll fly it. And it's not as simple as that. Even, even with the um, humble Harris Hawk, who are easy. Um, I know they're hated by a lot of the falconry world because they're the beginner's bird and anybody can fly them. I agree, yes, anybody with half a brain can train a Harris Hawk. But it takes a lot more work, effort and skill to get that bird to fly really, really well and to cast, fly and do more with them. So um, I think they're really underestimated and the most versatile bird in falconry. And I would challenge anybody that could only have one bird to, to not have one of these if you want to go and kill stuff with it, to be fair. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, you've got to fly from within. You've got to... You've got to love it and you've got to live it. And I think that's that's the key thing. And I do that every day, every second. So my poor husband. <laughs> and Anita, how do you go about creating that bond? Time, time and more time. Um, and that is it. It is, it's not just sitting with a bird on your glove. This is an element of it. But the key thing is being out in the field with that bird day in, day out doing what they want to do and what is wild and natural and being a part of the team. And that is how you create that bond and that trust. And I've tried having volunteers and it's not worked. So I'm back to doing 100% of it myself. Why didn't it work with the volunteers, Anita? Unless somebody's here all the time, the birds won't accept them. I don't trust a couple of my birds with anybody but me. And I just wasn't prepared to take the risk in terms of injury or anything like that uh, and I have to admit they're all mine and I want things done a certain way. And so what jobs are there with birds of prey? So I guess there's the obvious ones working in centres, very popular these days is the pest control aspect, breeding programmes, working for centres that do breeding programmes and the big falconry centres and I guess obviously there's there's the the, the, the veterinary aspect. Um, we could definitely do with some people in the UK becoming avian specialists and um, working with them in terms of conservation and rehab I suppose at wildlife centers and things like that I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend going into it to anybody that's got to make a living out of it because you'll be challenged um, and which brings me on to actually the, the, the challenges I think of running a business in it I have spent all day today doing paperwork for my reapplication for my animal activities license um and that's been um yeah onerous is probably the word i would use um because it's very yeah there's a lot of paperwork to do so there's all those aspects as well which make it a lot more of a challenge for anybody coming into it i think um and costly as well anita how do you see your own business developing i mean you started out with harris hawks doing hawk walks you've got a red tail you've got uh willow the barn owl how do you see things developing 10 years from now? Will you have your own centre? No, 100% not. I want to do a bit more educational stuff, which means I can be indoors and, and, and things like that, perhaps. Um, and I just wanted to offer something slightly different to Harris Hawks. If I won the lottery, um, I would like to have some kind of facility for unwanted ex-falconry birds. I but there are a lot of birds of prey, um, Harris hawks particularly, that get bought, moved on, sold, this, that, passed around. Um, and they live for a long time. And I love these little guys. And I would give every single one a home if I could. That I can see people going, oh, I've had it for, you know, I've had it for six months. It doesn't go what I want to do. I'll sell it and I'll get another one that does do what I want it to do. When actually what they need is a bit of time and input. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Problems I'd like to have a big centre in, but that that will take a lot of money and a lot of hours, which I don't have. So, how did COVID and bird flu affect the business? 
Um, COVID, weirdly very well, because I started just as COVID struck. I was still working part-time as a gardener and I started Hampshire Hawk Walks just before lockdown started. When things opened up and people were allowed to go out and exercise, etc., I took people on one-to-one -one hawk walks. Um, and then as things developed, the, the place where I did my hawk walks, um, a lot of people saw me doing them. And then I got bookings from that. And then because people couldn't go on holiday, a lot of people did staycations and experiences. So I got loads and loads of bookings. Um, and so I bought more birds and all those sorts of things. So actually, weirdly, COVID probably helped me rather than hampered my business. Um, and because I wasn't a centre and because I didn't have to, you know, literally I met people outdoors. I went through a brief, you know, this is how you handle a hawk and we went for a walk. I wasn't breaking any rules. So, um, yeah, it was probably slightly positive. Bird flu, um, Christ, awful. Constant worry every day. Obviously, we adhere to the guidelines. I am very lucky in the fact that I have no major water bodies anywhere near where I fly. Sorry, Guinness. Um, so I don't have lots of passing migratory birds, ducks, geese, and what I call like, you know, the the, the high incidences of um of avian flu. It's always a worry. I disinfect do all of the things that I should but fundamentally I still go out and fly my birds and try and avoid um killing waterfowl and other birds and things like that. Anita what do you think about the uh, the authorities wanting to ban tethering? Uh I think it's very uneducated um and I understand why they're doing it or why it's perceived because the general public think tethering birds is cruel um it's a lack of education for some birds of prey for their own welfare for the safety of the falconer tethering is an essential tool within what we do i think there should be guidelines on how it's used and i don't think any bird should be left tethered 24 7 but a total ban is completely ridiculous and shows that we're not being listened to um and we have um authorities that will just do whatever despite i think being told that by people that know that it's, it, you know, it should be used properly. I am lucky that all of my birds are calm in their aviaries and they are all free lofted. However, at certain times, um, they do need to be tethered when they're being brought, brought, brought back into work after being free lofted and things like that. So um, I think it's just up to us as falcons to educate the public that tethering is, is not cruel and that a bird will happily sit on a perch for long periods of time because they would do it in the world wild. Yeah, do I agree with Van? No, I don't. Somebody wanting to take up falconry or hawking, uh, watching this, what advice can you offer them, Anita? Find somebody um, that you can spend some time with and understand what is involved. I, I would not put anybody off getting involved in falconry if they have the time and the resources to do it. Um, but it's not for the faint hearted. And I think that a lot of people don't appreciate what's involved until they're in it. Can you suggest a research topic for any students watching this? Red kites, how, how they've spread their impact on other wildlife, on other birds of prey, whether they are sticking in certain areas, just a general understanding more about the impact of that reintroduction, um, how well they're doing, say, and, and the the e ecological impact of that, and actually, was it a good was it a good thing? It's an area that I would be really interested to know more about. Is that is that a useful subject? You're a well educated person. That's brilliant. That's a brilliant one. And Anita, can you complete this sentence, please? Harris hawks are. I would say Harris hawks are the most versatile bird of prey for falconry. What books or people or meetings have most influenced you, Anita? So the Coulsons, uh, they wrote the book The Harris Hawk Revolution. It is my bible alongside uh, Understanding Birds of Prey, um, which I keep by, beside my bed and I just read and read and reread. I would like to be the Coulsons of the UK. Anita, is there anything that you'd like to add? Not really. I mean, it's been great chatting to you. I've been looking at some of your interviews that you've done and some of the stuff you've done and you're a very well travelled and uh, interesting person so hopefully we will speak again and keep in touch and uh, 
But no, I mean, my my parting words for anybody getting into falconry is um, it's tough. And a lot of days you will question why you were doing it when you're sat under a tree trying to get a bird down. Um, when a bird has hurt you, which if you're a falconer, you will get hurt. It challenges you every day. But when it goes well, I'm oh, just looking, there's a kite just gone past my window out the window. Um, but when it goes well and when you're out there and you get a kill or you're working with your birds it and for me as well this is this is the thing the life-changing thing was I love my life out in the woods because I spent hours out in the woods and it's not just flying with my birds it's especially during the winter you go and you hunt and you catch for me now I live off wild caught game that I catch with my birds and or or friends shoot but a bit, it's changed my life in that term so it's a holistic lifestyle that can be very, very rewarding in terms of what you can just just lifestyle changes that they bring you as well um, and appreciating other things when you're out in, in that environment. So they make you look up. So, um, yeah, stick with it. If you have bad days, don't give up, go with it, but be prepared that it's a tough journey. Anita, you run Hampshire Hawk Walks in England. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. No problem. Come and visit me sometime. <laughs>